Good morning again, church. Take out your Bibles, if you will, and turn to the book of Daniel, the third chapter. We began this story of the fiery furnace last week and stopped right at the uh, pinnacle of the story. So if you weren't here or you don't recall, before we get into the 19th verse, let me share with you what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have just done. So King Nebuchadnezzar has asked them to worship his God as well as their God, and they've refused. He has threatened their life, threatened to throw them into the fiery furnace, but he gives them one last opportunity. He says, if you're willing to bow down, fine. If not, what God can save you from my hand? In the 16th verse, we hear this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, We do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace." Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like the son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening to the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out. Come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. And the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their heads singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble. For no other God can save in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Here ends the reading of God's word. What a story. So this is an image of a Babylonian brick oven. The oven that uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into is probably more like this. They would introduce ore in the top, fuel in the bottom. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would have been thrown in from the top and fallen into the furnace. When it says it was heated seven times hotter than usual, they had the ability to introduce into the bottom of the furnace pipes connected to large bellows to introduce more oxygen to let the fire get hotter. I may or may not be a pastor who has used a leaf blower to do something similar. It's a lot of fun. (laughs) Not only is the furnace extremely hot at the point that they are dropped in, but they are bound as though anyone has ever survived a furnace, period. Much less one superheated. 
and much less being bound. But they were dropped into the top. And then the king leaps to his feet in amazement. Because what he sees startles him. Three men go in. And he sees four men walking around. The only thing the fire has done has caused the bindings to go away. They are unbound and unharmed. So he calls them out. And out comes Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In the intertestamental period, the time period between the closing of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament, that 400-year period, there was an event called the Maccabean Revolt. It was an organized Jewish revolt against the Roman rule and the Roman emperor who was torturing Jews. They looked back to this event and found great strength as they were tortured. They believed this event to be an authentic, true event that happened as recorded in the 6th century B.C., Fast forward to the New Testament, to the book of Hebrews, the 11th chapter, in verse 32 and 34, and we hear about all these people who have exhibited their faith in God, and it says, and the prophets who through faith quenched the fury of the flames. The author of the book of Hebrews believed this to be an authentic story from the described time period. So what can we learn from the experience of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Well, first of all, their faith was based on God's character, not God's performance. What do I mean by that? God's character is his omnipotence. That means all-powerful. His omnipresence means he was everywhere. The fact that he's an all-loving God You know, you say, well, pastor, it's easy to trust God when everything's going well. Can I remind you that everything was not going well for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? These three are teenagers living in Jerusalem, and God allows their land to be invaded by the Babylonians. They're scooped up, taken from their homes, and hauled off to a foreign country. They are forced for three years to learn about Babylonian culture, Babylonian religion, Babylonian language. Their names are changed to honor Babylonian gods, not the one true God, like their names originally were. They are forced to serve the king. Their life has been threatened on multiple times, once because some seers couldn't translate in, in uh, a dream of Nebuchadnezzar's, and it's only thanks to their friend Daniel that they didn't get killed that time, and now their life is being threatened again because they're being demanded to worship a foreign god. It is not going swimmingly for them. Their life is not firing on all cylinders. And yet, they still have faith in God. Their faith and their obedience is based on God's character. From the time they were very small, they were taught God's word. Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5, 13 to 17 says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Verse 13, fear the Lord your God, serve him only and take your oaths in his name. Do not follow other gods, the gods of the peoples around you. For the Lord your God who is among you is a jealous God and his anger will burn against you and he will destroy you from the face of the land. Do not put the Lord your God to the test as did Massah. Be sure to keep the commands of the Lord your God and the stipulations and decrees he has given you. This was part of the fabric of who these young men were so that by the time that they are teenagers, it is part and parcel of who they are. And they have no problem having faith in being obedient, even in the face of the chaos that's going on in their life. All they had to do was bow a knee 
to a stupid statue that meant nothing, and they could have saved their own hides. And yet they say no. Everything else in their life is chaos, but they're still not willing to not trust God, to not have faith in him, to not be obedient to him. As a result, when they find themselves in a furnace, God is not saying, if you manage to get out of there, let me know and I'll come by. No, he is in the furnace with them. He is in the crisis with them. This is not some weird test. He's right there, walking with them. So what's this have to teach us? Well, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we are called to a life of faith and obedience. Not because of what God has done, but because of who God is. He is the one who created us, created all that is around us. He is the one that deserves our praise and our obedience. When life is good and when life is not. Folks, a life without struggle is not known in the biblical record. The biblical record is chucked full of lives that include hard times. King Daniel or King David, for all that he was, for the first part of his life, is being pursued by King Saul as he attempts to kill him. He's living in caves, he's on the run. He knew hard times. He lost his firstborn son to death. He understood what it was to have loss. His kids, chaos. If you have children that are kind of out of control, read about David's. You will find someone who has gone down that road as well. You see, life often includes hard times. That doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. I know there are faith perspectives out there that will tell you that. If you're not healthy, wealthy, and wise, it's your fault. You don't have enough faith. That's not what the biblical record says. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were doing it right, and where'd they wind up? In the furnace. It wasn't because of a lack of faith. Life without struggle is not known in the biblical record. And yet, no matter whether it's going wonderfully or poorly, you are never alone. God has placed within us his Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit walks with us through all the chaos of life. Joshua 1, 5. God says to Joshua, No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Deuteronomy 31, 6. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them, for the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Hebrews 13, 5. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. I don't care what you're dealing with. God's there. He is always present. Some of you have relationships that seem so broken they will never, ever get healed. Some of you have no idea how you're going to meet your expenses for the next month. Some of you have lost your job and don't know where you're going to find another one. Some of you have children or are so out of control, you're not sure you're ever going to get them back. But you're not there alone. God's journeying with you. 
God is with you in that fire. There's a song by Hillsong United called Another in the Fire. Listen to these words. There's a grace when the heart is under fire, another way when the walls are closing in, and when I look at the space between where I used to be in this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. There's another in the fire standing next to me. There's another in the waters holding back the sea. And should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free, there's a cross that bears the burden where another died for me. All my debt left for dead beneath the waters, I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore. And should I fall in the space between what remains of me in this reckoning, either way, I won't bow to the things of this world. And I know I will never be alone. For there's another in the fire standing next to me. There's another in the waters holding back the sea. And should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free, there's a cross that bears the burden where another died for me. And I can see the light in the darkness as the darkness bows to him. I can hear the roar of the heavens as the space between wears thin. I can feel the ground shake beneath, beneath us as the prison walls cave in. Nothing stands between us. Nothing stands between us. There is no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come what may in the space between all the things unseen in this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. There will be another in the fire standing next to me. There will be another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding how good you've been to me, I'll count the joy that comes every battle because I know that's where you'll be. Every battle, that's where God is. Let me be honest with you. Sometimes we sense him so much better in the midst of the battle than when things are going easy. When things are hard, you sense them, you smell them, you see them, you feel them. I don't know what your battle is today, but I guarantee you one thing, you're not battling alone. He's there. I'll count the joy come every battle because I know that's where you'll be. He was there with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He walked them through the fire and brought them out the other side. You may find yourself in the fire this week, but you're not there alone. Let's pray. Father, wherever we find ourselves this day, we pray that we would sense your presence. May we know that we are not alone. We are not forsaken. We may have no humans around us, but you are always there. Thank you for journeying with us, Father. Thank you that one day our journey will be with you in glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.